James Bateman. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm engaged right now. I uh, have a beautiful fiance and a beautiful son uh, at three years old. He's James the fourth. Uh, so, I mean, I'm a oldest of nine siblings. So I come from a big family. So uh, I've always been like the leader or role model uh, for my group, for my family. So um, being like, you know, point guard is like a natural role for me. Tell us a bit about growing up with, with that many siblings and, and how, I guess. All right, well, <laughs> uh, honestly, it was me and then five girls uh, straight. And then my three younger brothers are all at the end. So it was me with a house full of, you know, women, ladies, and uh, that was that was tough. I had to, you know, try to play sports with them, and I mean, it, it it was cool because you know they always wanted to look up to me, but it was just like I had a bunch of younger girls, and then they you know have attitudes and stuff like that. So it, it was tough. It was tough. And when I finally got my first brother, when I was like, I think he's he is 17 now. So yeah, when I was about 10, 11. Uh, then it was like, okay, finally, I got him. So I roughened him up and got him, you know, super tough. And uh, right now, it seems like the plan is working. I mean, he he's you know highly rated uh, in the ESPN. You uh, he, he's 63 right now in the country. Uh, so I think it was a method to my madness. But uh, yeah, man, it was it was it was fun growing up with a lot of siblings. Though you you really had to share everything that you had. Um, you know, you 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 value family a lot more, uh, especially coming from a big family like that. Uh, I mean, we wasn't, you know, the poorest family, uh, but we definitely wasn't the richest. Uh, so I, I think I think that was like my my cornerstone of, of what I'm made of is, is just that family uh, loyalty and stuff like that. I can imagine that the family when basketball began inspired you to be like, I, I want to make a career out of this and give back, yes, but to show all my other younger siblings that you can do whatever you achieve. Yeah, yeah, it, it was it was you know challenging being the oldest. You always had to set the standard, uh, be a role model. Um, but with with them, you know, I always wanted to be like I wanted to be the one to help them get a head start in life uh, because I didn't have any older siblings. I really didn't have too many mentors growing up. Uh, that were like close to me in age. So it was tough for me to look at somebody and be like, well, this is possible. Uh, so when I knew that I wanted to, you know, make a career out of basketball, um, they was always supporting at every game. We had the whole stands field. I had my own section because it's <laughs> nine of us. So uh, yeah, I always have my own section at the games and it was just very supportive. Uh, and yeah, it, it just pushed me to go harder. And, and I felt like with me, you know, trying to set an example for them. It helped all of them out, like in their own ways. They're all doing something, you know, special, uh, whether it's doing hair or, you know, going to school. Uh, one one is studying abroad in Africa right now. Uh, they all kind of had that same drive that I had. And, and I felt like it had a lot to do with how I set the, set the tone. Are any of them going to come out to Australia so you're here? I'm hoping so. Uh, my sister last year, she got to visit me out in Israel. Uh, right before she went to Africa to study abroad, so that was nice. Uh, I'm hoping so. I'm trying to set something up right now uh, so they can come to a game because the NBA they they've been you know blowing my phone up like man these games are lit like and we can understand like the commentation commentators and stuff like that. So because it's in English, so they they're excited. Uh, they're watching every every preseason game, even though it's at three in the morning, four in the morning. They try to catch the second half or something like that. So uh, I'm hoping to get them out here. That would that would be really fun. Uh, either one of them or one of my parents. Uh, that would that would be nice. That would be nice. I'm I'm praying for it. Tell me a little bit about becoming a dad yourself, then, because your parents you've seen them and they raised you, obviously, and then to have a son of your own. And uh, how's that journey been? Uh, it's, it's been great. I, I honestly see why, you know, the things my parents did for me growing up that I didn't understand. When you finally have your first kid, then you realize, like, that's why, you know, they was kind of overprotective on certain things. That's why they pushed me to be hard, because it's like a split image of myself. Like, when I'm looking at him, not only does he have the same name and same sign, he's just like, I just see myself so much in him. He He has my actions. He has little stuff that I do, mannerisms and how he walk. Like I got a little pigeon toe walk and he's walking that way. And so 
stuff like that. It's just, it's just amazing to see him grow. And, you know, when he's at the game and he's, like, yelling daddy and he telling me after the game, you make a layup and a three-point and a free throw. Like, I mean, that just warms my heart. Man, that just keeps me wanting to keep going, keep going. And now he, like, can understand the game. Uh, before he was, you know, in the car seat watching the game, he didn't know. But now he understands. It just makes it so much better. It gives me an extra fuel, an extra thrive to, you know, just keep showing him, like, you know, the sky is the limit. So um, being, a, being a dad – really was kind of, I would say, easy for me to transition to having nine siblings. I was always like the big brother, big, I was like the dad already. So uh, now having my own, it's a little different, but it's special, man. It's one of the most special moments you can ever have in life. You're a competitor on the court. You're very fun to watch. If there's a bad loss or you've had a, a poor game, can you switch that off when you get to your son at home or are you still taking that in? See, that's the thing. I try so hard not to because I want to be locked in on the game. And he would just say something to make me laugh. And then it's just like, I can't even be mad no more. Like, he would say, like, or he would want to play basketball and now I got to have a whole second game. So then my competitive nature, I'll beat him. And then now I feel better. Like, I got to win. And and nah, I just yeah, it, it's 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 cool though. Like ha having to come home to that, uh, him and my fiance, like they they always you know brighten the mood mood. So uh, it's pretty easy. Like after a loss or something like that. But I definitely have that time on the way home to drive home. They know, chill. But even him, he still he will say something crazy, and I'll be like, man, I'm trying to be mad right here. And you, you, you making me happy. So I love it, man. I love it. Your family coming to Australia and Brisbane. You've already been to Australia when you played here at LMU. Uh, first experiences of Brisbane. How's everybody enjoying it? Uh, we're loving it, man. We're loving it. We try not to look so far into the future, uh, so I don't want to say too much. You know, with contracts and stuff out there, I don't want to speak too much. But man, we we really love Australia. Uh, and I think Brisbane couldn't have been a better spot for us. Uh, it's so much to do. So my family, they're transitioning well. Um, I'm about to get my son to start school soon. So uh, that will be, you know, pretty unique that he get to go to school in a different country. Uh, so, yeah, man, I, I'm loving it so far, man. Everything is, you know, I would say Americanized, so it's easy to adapt. Uh, the only problem I had was driving on the other side of the road the first two days. But uh, after that, I I've been good now. I'm used to it now. So I don't have no complaints. I'm just enjoying the time here, man. I won't put out the citizenship thing yet. We'll do that next year. Uh, when we... uh, just want to talk a bit about the basketball journey. Talk about your relationship with Mike Dunlap at LMU and then where you've played and how you even arrived at the Brisbane Bullets. Uh, well, Mike Dunlap, he, he helped my game tremendously. Uh, he has a unique style, uh, as a lot of people know, of you know getting the best out of his players. But he did teach me a lot about the game of basketball. He's very knowledgeable. Uh, he knows a lot about the game. And then he played or coached in Australia many years, so he knew how the game translated. A lot of his styles and methods that we use in college, uh, it was from him coaching overseas. So um, playing under him, was probably the best thing that could have happened to my career because, you know, I played for a really tough coach that I don't think no coach on any level could even top where he was at, uh, you know, with the with the mental aspect and how tough he was and how hard he was. Uh, so that helped me for, you know, the future. When I ran into tough coaches, I'm like, oh, this is easy. Like, it, it was easy to be away from home and have a tough coach because I'm like, I've been through that already uh, in college. Uh, but he definitely helped me understand understand the game so much where it was starting to slow down for me. And I was playing at a pro level in college. And then when I got transitioned to the pros, it was like I was already there already. So uh, it was like an easy transition. So uh, he, he helped me a lot. He helped me a lot with my basketball journey and, and coming to Australia. You gonna have to try and get him out here to come watch a Bullets game. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna try, but I mean, the guy he retired at first, and then now he he's back coaching. I seen that he's the head coach of another D2, and I'm like, man, sit down. Like, I'm praying for you, Molly. I'm, if you watch this, uh, his wife is uh, she's a, she's a true warrior, man. Because the guy can't can't stay away from basketball, and I 
I got a feeling that's how I'm gonna be when I get older, but I'm trying to block it out right now because, I mean, that that's, it, it's kind of insane how much he loves basketball, man. He just can't stay away from it. I started off my journey at LMU. Uh, well, I went to junior college first uh, out of high school. I wasn't highly recruited out of high school, so um, I had to go to a junior college route. I wanted to take a chance on myself. I had D2 offers, um, but I felt that I was a D1 player. Uh, so I went two years of junior college. Uh, I finished uh, all state, I, I mean, all all American honorable mention my first year and second team all American my second year. Uh, I was able to get a division one scholarship to Loyola Marymount where I played for Mike Dunlap. Uh, and there uh, I was second team all conference my first year and first team all tournament. Uh, with one of my biggest performances uh, against, you know, Gonzaga in the conference tournament. And then the second year, I was first team all-league, all and um, it was, you know, a great year for me. I probably averaged like 17 points, you know, both years. Uh, and then leaving there, my first year was Latvia, which was probably my toughest place to play because, um, I mean, I was, quite frankly, like the only – black guy in my whole city. Uh, so that had to get some getting used to. Like, uh, I, I mean, everywhere I go, everybody was staring at me, looking at me, and it wasn't because I was famous or they knew I played basketball. It was literally just because of the color of my skin. Uh, so that was a little challenging being there by myself, uh, but I was able to perform well. And right as I was peaking, uh, COVID hit, so COVID, made us take a step back from basketball. Uh, and then my next step was having to go to a second league in, in France, um, which where I started off pretty good. Uh, I was in front running for MVP and then I went down and, and got hurt. Uh, due to like the COVID, we was like having stoppages um, and go, stop, go, stop, go. So uh, it was kind of rough on the body. Um, so yeah, my second year, I was all import of the year uh, in, in the Pro B. And then after that, transferred to Greece, uh, top league, was there half a year. Um, played really well, played for a legendary coach there. Uh, and then after that, was bought out halfway through the year and went to Germany, uh, which is where I probably had the best statistical year of my career. Uh, I strived out there. I was almost shooting close to 50% from field and 46% from, from the three. So it was a crazy year, and I was doing that all off the bench. Uh, so it was like uh, transitioning to a different element of my game because I was starting all, always, you know, my whole career outside of my rookie career. And so when I had to, you know, take a back seat and, you know, come off the bench and I was still the leading scorer, Leading assist guy, it was just like um, I, I did something for myself to show them I can play, you know, no matter what the coach need, I can do that and still perform at a high level. Uh, and I felt like that helped me get to the Israel gig that I had, and which was probably the most challenging year playing wise, uh, because as you know, you know, the circumstances, it was a war that occurred while I was there. Uh, so that was pretty, pretty horrific. Uh, just the, the aftermath of everything. You were, you know, teammates with guys who lost family members, lost friends. Uh, and, and it was like, it was a tragic time to even think about basketball. Uh, so it, it took a while for me to really let that sink in uh, to really how tough that year was because we were able to leave and evacuate for a month, but then the season re restarted. Um, but before that, it took maybe like a week before I can actually get home. So my family was worried sick. Uh, it was it was a time uh, I know nothing about like the bomb shelters and nothing like that. Nobody ever even spoke of that because they didn't even think something like that would even happen. Uh, so my first time hearing a missile alert go off and I had to go into the bomb shelter, uh, it, was, it, was, it was really, really like um, a tragic thing for me. Uh, and, and one of those things I, I look back on, still kind of had PTSD on is, you know, I had to make phone calls to 
family and friends, like, I'm not sure if, if I'm coming home. You know, I don't know what's going on. Uh, and, and, and it was real, it was really tough, uh, the phone call I had to make to my fiance, uh, just to tell her, like, you know, I'm not sure what's going on. You know, don't, you know, look too much into the media. Um, but I can tell you now I'm going to the bomb shelter. Everything will be all right, but um, in the event it's not, you know, take care of my son, make sure my son, you know, grow up to be um, better than me. And and that was tough, man. That was that was probably the toughest point of my life or, or the hardest thing I ever had to do was tell her that. And and I think she's still traumatized to this day from, from that phone call. So um, with that being said, uh, obviously it was very tough to convince her to let me go back to finish the season. Um, but you know, she wanted what's best for my career. Uh, and, and I thank her for that every day. Uh, and I thank my family for understanding because uh, a lot of people don't know the sacrifices a lot of players go through. And a lot of players didn't return that season to Israel, but I was one of them. And, and I went back and ended up having probably Another great statistical year. Uh, we end up, you know, upsetting some guys and end up making it to the Final Four. So it was one of the best years of my career, and it was uh, all off of a tragic event that you really couldn't accept the whole, you know, success story because of you know all the families and families I had to talk to and spend time with and children and. I mean, one guy, one little kid, uh, hit his he had just lost his sister, and and his his one thing that he wanted was to see me uh, come to his school, and that was that was man, that was like this this kid lost his sister, something I couldn't even imagine, and his one wish was was to get to meet me in person. And and meeting him, man, that was that was that was amazing, man. I'm glad I was able to do that for for him and his family. Uh, but things like that, man, made the success story. You, you couldn't even really take in like what we really did, uh, taking the lowest budget team that hasn't never made the playoffs to the final four. Like it, it, it was it was amazing, but definitely a tough time. And that all led me here to you know the NBL. Uh, which I'm excited to get into. Um, now I get to team up with a guy I've, I've known for a few years, Keandre Cook. Uh, I tried to recruit him to LMU. Didn't do a good job, obviously, because he didn't come. But uh, now that he recruited me, since he signed first, and you know he got me to the bullets, I felt like he's a better recruiter than me. Uh, so now we finally get to be on you know teams. Uh, it's crazy because uh, I recruited him at LMU. He played for the same team I played for in, in Krelsheim in Germany. And he also was about to recruit me when he played in France for Blue Owl, but I had went to Greece instead. So uh, our, our paths finally aligned. So now we finally get to team up in that backcourt and you know show the world what we're capable of. But, yeah, man, I'm excited about this year in the NBL, and, and it's going to be fun.